Well, tonight we're going to have a little bit of fun. We have a panel, and the panel includes four great people who are going to start off by giving us a little personal remembrance of Stan. And then we've got some questions. We're going to ask the panelists some questions about recent sporting events. And through a mysterious avenue, we're going to see what Stan would think about those questions. Pat, would you give us your favorite recollection of Stan Ackman? And I know you have many from overseeing him over the years. I could go on and on. Uh, I can remember buying, uh, lived in Philadelphia my whole life. I remember going to Howe's Pharmacy at 3rd and Duncannon in Albany, seven or eight years old, to buy a Daily News and find out how the Phillies did overnight on the West Coast. And I bought those papers back then to read Stan Hockman as a young man. Uh, later in life, I was fortunate enough to work at the Daily News. And uh, Stan was there when I came in in 1980. And I worked with Stan until the unfortunate day that he passed last year. So many things stick out. One of them is about Stan. You see how he mastered everything, what a great writer he was, how great he was on the radio, how terrific he was on TV. He reviewed things. He did so many things so well. But what I bring up is how fast he did them. It was a thing to behold to watch Stan Hockman working a typewriter. He had this big ring on one of his fingers that Gloria would be able to tell you about. And he went so fast, he could crank out one of those columns that you would think that he spent a month thinking about in 30 minutes. He would fly. It was an incredible thing to see. It really was. And uh, one of the great writers in Philadelphia history is also up here with us, Ray Didinger. And Ray, those columns didn't come in 30 minutes, did they? Rarely. No. <laughs> but uh, the one thing that I'd like to point out about Stan is that uh, a lot of people in many facets of life, learned a lot of things from Stan, and I was certainly among them. And I'll give you an example. I became sports editor in 1989, and I remember being in the office, had to be the early 90s. And Stan came in and we were talking, and I treasured those times that we get a chance to talk. And Stan asked what we were doing. And it was at a time where the Dallas Cowboys were having a lot of turmoil Guys were getting locked up, uh, suspended. There were all kind of characters on the Cowboys. You mean like today? <laughs> Some things never change, Governor. And so we were, he said, well, what are you doing? And I showed him this graphic we had that showed all these people on the Cowboys. And basically, we're not stupid. We were making fun of the Cowboys. That plays well to a Philadelphia audience. But we had the thing laid out, and Stan got a couple chuckles from it. And he enjoyed it, and he liked what, it was, uh, what we were doing. And then he said to me, well, who wrote this? And I said, well, it's kind of like a group effort. The staff, we kind of threw different lines around about different guys, and we all put it together. And he said, but whose name's going on it? I said, well, it's going to say Daily News staff. Stan kind of shook his head, and I said, well, what's wrong? He said, I don't like that. He said if you're going to criticize the Cowboys, and he said, don't get me wrong, this is funny, and I like that you're criticizing the Cowboys. Somebody needs to put their name on it. Somebody needs to stand behind the criticism and be responsible for it for the Daily News so that if it comes back and you have to be challenged. And Stan was a giant proponent of the idea that if he wrote a column criticizing Gene Mock or Billy Cunningham or Raleigh Massimino, uh, or Bob Clark. He felt the next day, even if he wasn't writing, that he had to be out there in the locker room to be made available so that if the subject was upset with what was written, that they could come up and complain and talk it through with Stan. And I thought that was a great lesson, and it was a great indicator of what a great man Stan was. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> Stephen. I, uh... I met Stan, I guess it was 2001. He came down and did a story on our program and he kind of adopted our program. Um, from then on, he helped cover and he helped uh, promote our barnstorming tours in 2004 and uh, in 2012. But, but the biggest impact he had with our kids 
and will continue to have is with the new Major League Baseball Urban Youth Academy. If, if you don't know what that is, it's, it started as a concept I had uh, about 11 years ago, and we talked about it back then. It's a, it's a partnership between Major League Baseball, the Phillies, and the city. So in 2010, the money was in place, and they held a press conference, and it, they probably regret that to this day, <laughs> because at that point, Stan was going to hold them accountable. And when, you're, when you have three entities like that, there are a lot of roadblocks, uh, there are a lot of obstacles in the way, and it, it kept stalling, and it looked like the project was going to die. And every time it did, every time it did, Stan jumped on it. He would call and say, how's it going? Well, I haven't really heard anything. Next thing you know, there's, here comes a, a story about the uh, people dragging their feet, and he was just a thorn in their sides. Uh, I know, I know uh, and, and every time the story would come out, the next day I would get an email saying, oh, yeah, bid's going out on this today. You know, <laughs> these, suddenly the insurmountable obstacles disappeared. Um, and I, I know, I know, like, uh, on Park Avenue in New York and on, down there at the stadium on South Broad, uh, the guys were having nightmares hearing Stan Hoffman on line one because uh, they knew they were in trouble and he was going to hold their feet to the fire. But he cared. He truly cared about the mission and, and, and about the kids. And he wasn't, he never hesitated to use his voice to push for that, to push for social justice. Um, he, he once told me his, his before he left, he wanted to see two things. And one was the, the Fraser statue erected, and two was that this academy be built, and he wanted to see it open. Now, the academy is slated to open in June. Uh, the building is almost complete. And although Stan won't be there in person, he will be there in spirit, and he absolutely knew before he left us that he had rescued this project and he had and, and it was getting done and that thousands of kids were going to benefit from from that relentless push um and and it just because he cared so much for the kids i i came across an email today i mean we're we're, we're eternally grateful to stand for that yeah, you'll be seeing more about the academy on the news but i came across an old email he sent me back in 2011 and i think this really sums up the person Stan was, in, in my eyes. Uh, we, have, we shared a lot of emails. And in November of 2011, Joe Frazier just passed away, and we all know how Stan felt about Joe. Um, Buddy Ryan was, was sick, and a lot of stuff was going on, but he told me, um, he said, he started off, he said, uh, we, can, we can get together, I'll share some of the stuff that has been tormenting me for the last few days. He said, I wrote a documentary on a week in the life of Penn State football. And while our crew was up there, we turned a blind eye to what was happening with the minority players on the team because I guess it would have changed the whole tone of the film. It haunts me to this day. He said, last night I turned down a chance to appear on Daily News Live to talk about Joe Frazier to go instead to the reception preceding the Otho Davis dinner to make sure I hugged Buddy Ryan and told him he was in my thoughts and prayers. But he was thrilled to see me, so I know I did the right thing. Stan, and that, that was him to me. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Joe? So um, <clears throat> I got to meet Stan through my dad, Joe Han Sr., uh, who started the friendship with uh, Stan back in the days when my father was part of the Cloverlay organization that managed Joe Frazier's heavyweight career. And that's where my dad's friendship with, uh, with Stan started. I got involved later in the business with my dad. And, um, you know, they, they, got, they asked me to come up here tonight to say, you know, what's my greatest memory? And I thought, geez, you know, I don't necessarily have a lot of sports memories to share about Stan. My dad could come up here and talk for hours and you would probably enjoy him so much more and all the stories he could tell you. But here's my story with Stan and what happened was we were at a dinner one night and it was a, um, a dinner right after Harry Callis had died. 
and it was kind of a somber event. I think it was at Ruth, Ruth, Ruth Chris's Steakhouse in Center City. Dad says, hey, come on over here. I want to talk you to talk to Stan. I want him to tell you about that project you're involved in. At the time, I was uh, joining a bunch of people uh, up in Bucks County where my home is um, and starting the idea of, of building what they call a Miracle League field. And this whole idea is, is that this is a baseball field that is built for uh, special need and handicapped kids. So I sort of reluctantly go over and I tell Stan about it and you know, he, he, he seems interested, right? And I, and I think, well, that was a pretty nice conversation and I know a couple days later I get a phone call. So tell me more about this Miracle League and what he was really doing was, I think he was really just checking me out to make sure that this thing was for real. So I said, yeah, we're trying to raise money and I stand, you know, it's, it, we're looking at the budget. It's like we got to raise like a million two to build this field and we're not really getting much money in there or anything like that. I want to do an article. Let me do an article about it. Okay. So he writes the article and the next thing you know, a couple phone calls start trickling in and uh, he calls me. How's, how's it going? And I said, well, um, we're, we're really far from like the million two. We need somebody to give us a big check. He goes, you have a pencil paper there? I said, yeah. And he goes, I want you to write this guy's name down. I want you to call him. So I said, okay, now who am I calling? He goes, whatever the gentleman's name was. And he tells me, he goes, I was traveling across the country. I got laid over in Kansas City and I was in the uh, airport and the guy says, you're Stan Hockman, right? And he goes, yeah, I'm from Philadelphia. I read your article every day. He says, I live in California, but I grew up in Philly. And he goes, I love it. It's, it's what connects me to Philadelphia. And so Stan, he says, I have this conversation and I think he wants to make a donation to the league. So I end up and I call this gentleman and he says, listen, I'm going to give you a check. And he says, the check's going to be for $25,000. I hadn't gotten a check for like over $100 at this point. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's great. He goes, but you got to do me one favor. When you do something and this field finally gets built, you have to acknowledge that this donation was made on behalf of Stan Hockman because He's what keeps me and my heart in Philadelphia. And Stan never told me that that's what, the, like I had to think to myself, so he's in Kansas City, laying over and he starts talking to some guy and the Miracle League comes up. And I think what I was learning at that point was is that you know, there was the sports side that all these guys up here knew about Stan. I got to become his friend because of his love of kids and how much he really enjoyed helping children. That's why he's here with the National Adoption Center. He loves kids. He did love kids. He loved our Miracle League. He stayed on me all the way through that whole project. Nobody really kind of knew what was going on. He'd call me every couple of weeks. How's the fundraising going? What number are we at now? I mean, he was like our big... He gets Jerry Wallman to call me. Jerry Wallman calls me. He's doing a book. Jerry Wallman starts to give us money from the proceeds of the sale of the book. Stan Hockman was, for me, the guy that kept the Miracle League going the whole time and finally got us to our goal of a million two. And so now in Northampton Township, there is this unbelievable field that's built up there for handicapped kids. And if you go by on a Saturday, you will see hundreds of kids wheelchairs, walkers, crutches, um, autistic children that are now playing baseball on a field that really um, was built because of a guy like Stan Hockman. And I will say this one thing, there's the field built there now and so many people were so generous in donating money and time to it. Um, there's a, basically a generic board there that says thanks for everybody that you know donated money um, to this field because it was hard to really try to remember everybody that ever gave money. But in a couple of weeks, there's going to be a dedication at that field with a plaque and a tree with Stan Hockman's name on it because that organization knows how vital and how important he was and how much he contributed to it. So I really did learn to love the guy. Dad, thanks for introducing me to your friend. He was great. And I'm very, very lucky to have him. Great show. Great story, Ray. I know you probably have to sort through 10 or 15 great stories to pick one. Yeah, um, I, I think it's pretty obvious, just listening to what everybody said up here, that Stan um, was more than someone with huge talent. Stan also had a huge heart. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of great sports writers and a lot of great sports media people in the city, 
who all leave marks on all of us to varying degrees. Stan's was the biggest and the most enduring, not just because he was a great writer, and I do think he's the best writer the city's ever had, but because above, over and above that, it was the kind of person that he was. And what a lot of you don't know uh, is that before Stan became a sports writer, he was a teacher. He was a school teacher up in New York. Uh, and I've always believed that once you're a teacher, you're always a teacher. And I think Stan was a teacher who became a writer, but never stopped being a teacher. And I know there wasn't any time that I didn't ride on an airplane with him, sit next to him in a press box, share a radio show with him, or just ride in a car with him, that I didn't learn something. I mean, that's Stan, was, Stan had that gift. But it was, I, I knew two different stands, one as a competitor and one as a teammate. Uh, as a teammate, we worked together at the Philadelphia Daily News for many years later on. But before that, I was a columnist for the Philadelphia Bulletin working opposite Stan as a competitor when he was the Daily News. And I'll tell you, it was, it was a lot better to have him as a teammate <laughs> than a competitor. Because you didn't want to be writing against Stan Hockman day after day after day. Um, the one story that stands out in my mind was, it was the World Series, it was 77, 78, I don't remember which one, Yankees. Yankees-Dodgers, uh, series shifts back to New York for game six, uh, and I have spent two or three days just chasing Reggie Jackson around, trying to talk to him, and he was just the most miserable, unpleasant, rude, person you could ever imagine. So finally, I've had it. I sit down and I write a column where I just bury Reggie Jackson. And the bulletin runs it eight columns across the top of the sports section. And I still remember the headline. Oh, Reggie, what a bore you've become, is the headline. <laughs> runs totally across the top of the sports section. That night is game six at Yankee Stadium. I'm in the, I'm in the press box. Stan comes walking in. Stan comes over to me and he says, that's a pretty tough column you wrote on Reggie today. <laughs> and I said, you know, Stan, I've just had it with the guy. I've had it with him. I couldn't take it anymore. Everything I was feeling, I just let it out there. And Stan, Stan says, all right. <laughs> now, now, what he was saying there, obviously, is, is, is the wisdom of the ages. You don't totally bury somebody while they still have games left to play especially when it's Reggie Jackson and it's October. Well, I'm sure you all know how game six turned out. Reggie Jackson comes up the first time, first pitch, bam, home run. Reggie Jackson comes up again, first pitch, bam, home run. Reggie Jackson comes up third time, first pitch, bam, home run. Now I'm sitting in my press box seat just thinking about the 300,000 copies of the Philadelphia Bulletin that are circulating in the city. And think about what a fool I now look like. And I'm just sort of catatonic staring straight ahead. And all of a sudden I feel somebody's hand on my shoulder. And I look up and it's Stan. And Stan says, I think he hit the last one with a rolled up Bulletin. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. And, and speaking of good writing, Ray has written books and, of course, columns galore. But he's written a play, and it was uh, performed for a week in a community theater down in South Philly last uh, summer. And it got rave reviews. It was about Ray's relationship with Tommy McDonald, the great Hall of Fame Eagles player. And we're trying to raise money to, to put the show on in a different venue, in a bigger venue that more people can see it this summer. And we started a Kickstarter campaign uh, with the, the guys at WIP. And it, it's a great play. Uh, hope if you get a chance, you'll take a look at Kickstarter and maybe think uh, of helping us. And I just want you to know that part of Ray Dinger is being played by Justin Bieber. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Now we're going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to go uh, through and uh, ask these great uh, speakers that we have here tonight questions involving recent developments in sports. And the question is, what would Stan say about these developments? So we'll go down the line, starting with Ray. And the question is, 
Villanova wins the NCAA tournament. Is Villanova a Philadelphia school, Ray? Well, I don't know what Stan would say. I think I kind of do, but I'll just answer this for me. I think we're all supposed to just answer it as us. Um, of course it is. I mean, it might be on Lancaster Avenue, and it might be in Radnor or Rosemont. I'm not even sure where the lines divide. But if it's part of the Big Five, and they play games at the Palestra, of course they're a city school, especially when they're there. Yeah. The Ray, I, I rarely get a chance to correct Ray. Once we were watching an away game and we watched in the studio before oh, we got no. on the show. Oh, no, not the Oakland Raiders story again. <laughs> it was the Oakland Raiders who were terrible. Jamarcus Russell was their quarterback. He never won a game in the NFL. The Raiders are leading us, and I'm getting nervous, and I say at halftime, Ray, we're not going to lose this game, are we? He said, Governor, we're not going to lose this game. Midway through the third quarter, we're still behind. Governor, we're not going to lose this game. Start of the fourth quarter, Governor, we're not going to lose the game. All of a sudden, I look around and Ray's gone with two minutes left to go in the game. <laughs> well, that was almost as bad as when Dick Girardi, the great Dick Girardi, told me that there was no way Smarty Jones was going to lose the third leg of the, uh, the triple crown. Heartbreaking. All right, Joe. And by the way, Ray, just to correct you, this is according to Gloria. And just like Stan was never wrong, Gloria was never wrong. It says here, ask each panelist to tell the audience how he thinks Stan would have reacted to these six issues. So what would Stan have said, Joe, about was Villanova a Philadelphia school? I, I only can answer this with a house full of Villanova grads that, yes, it is. <laughs> Wise decision. Yes. S Steve. Uh, he, he would have loved the kids on that team. I know he would have loved the kids on that team. They were Philly-type kids all the way. He would have appreciated that. No question, they played great team basketball. Pat? Speaking of the great Dick Girardi, I went back to see how Stan would have covered Villanova in 1985. Uh -huh. Stan did many things, but one thing Stan couldn't do is be in two places at one time. So of course we would have had Stan at the national championship in 1985, but he was with watching the game with Dick Girardi, because April 1st, 1985, also was the reopening of Garden State Park. <laughs> and we had to have Stan there for it. Yeah. I do know, though, how we felt about the issue, because I have Stan's column about parades in general in Villanova from 1985. I'll try to read quickly, because Stan would have written it quickly. And now, here comes Villanova, a team that is so much greater than the sum of its parts. Here comes Villanova, spitting in the eye of the odds makers. Here comes Villanova, digging deep to do all the right things on defense at the tough, unglamorous end of the court. Here comes Villanova, hugging and kissing and high-fiving all ebony and ivory. Thus the city exulted. Even if Villanova is a mainline school, even if it's been years since a Philadelphia kid played there, the city exulted because the players squeezed everything they had out of each other, saving nothing for the pro tryout camps. The city exulted because the coach ignored the storm in his belly, even if the doctors call it diverticulitis and warn him of its hazards. The coach is a dervish on the sidelines, but he preaches poise and patience, and when it's close at the end, Villanova finds a way to win. Georgetown played well. This was no fluke triumph over a team that went sour or lost a key player to injury. Georgetown played well. Villanova played better. Raleigh Massimino says good things happen to people who work hard. That is the message Villanova brought to its parade. A wonderful thing happened to young men willing to work more hard, willing to sacrifice individually for the good of the group, willing to skin their knees in diving pursuit of the loose ball. They are so young and only three or four of them will ever make a living playing, playing pro ball. But they will all cherish this triumph for the rest of their lives. The rest of us ought to pay attention to how they achieved it. It might make the city a better place until it's time for the next parade. All right. I don't know if many of you know it, but I write a column on Saturdays for the Daily News. And I wrote a column early on, uh, before Villanova won the final game, saying we ought to have a parade. And one of the things I used was 1985, because I remember sitting on my TV, and the game came on, and the announcer said, and now, the national championship, Georgetown University from Washington, D.C., and Villanova University from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They are from Philadelphia. They are, as Ray said, part of the Big Five.
They deserved the parade, and they got a great parade in Philadelphia. So, next question, and I'm going to start with you, Pat, and go down the line. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. We do have Stan from special place. Stan, what do you think about Villanova being a city school? Of course, Villanova is a Philadelphia team. They're part of the Big Five. A city series unique to Philadelphia found nowhere else in the country. It's a source of discomfort and envy for a blue-collar city because Jay Wright's suit costs more than their car. Because <laughs> the kids who go to school on the main line are playing beer pong with champagne. And because most kids from Temple couldn't spell Archie the Akino if you spotted them the arch and the O. All right, thank you, Stan. Second question, we're going to start with Pat. Was it right? Was it right for Sam Hickey to resign via a letter? What do you think Sam would have said about that? He would have thought Stan Hickey, Sam Hickey was a piece of work, but what would he have said about resignation by letter? If Stan was working as a full-time columnist during the process, I guarantee you he would have had a nickname for this guy. I don't know what it was, but it would have been great. <laughs> and he would have, the whole letter, he would have taken that out. He would have gotten the biggest kick out of it, but by the time this guy resigned by a letter, more people in town would have known Sam Hinkie by the nickname Stan gave him than they would have known Sam Hinkie himself. Absolutely. Stephen. I, I agree. He would, he would have had a field day with that letter, uh, but Stan is a face-to-face -face kind of guy, and I think he would have been against the, uh, the, the resignation by letter. Joe? Yeah, I, I agree with Steve. I think Stan would have jumped all over that to just get the, uh, you know, the purpose behind it. It, 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 it sort of, I think, fit the Sam Hinkie era. Um, it, it was kind of awkward all along, but I think that would have been a field day for Stan to jump on and try to figure it out. Raven. We would have loved it. Stan would have absolutely just had, it would have been, <laughs> talk, about, talk about a hanging curveball right over the plate. <laughs> that would have been it. I mean, Stan's attitude to that would have been, I know the thing was referred to as the manifesto. <laughs> I could almost see Stan writing, manifesto. What is this guy, the Unabomber? <laughs> <laughs> and he, I'm sure he would have said that this was like everything else that had to do with Sam Hankey. It was insulting and it was inadequate. All right, Stan? A letter is the perfect way to remember a man who refused to speak. History will remember him as a man whose words we couldn't understand and whose players couldn't play. The strategy of drafting the best available injured athlete <laughs> caught on about as well as his vocabulary. Philly never took to optionality as he came within a hair's breadth of being hung by his trope. Fortunately <laughs> for Sixers fans, the process is over, and the only thing we remember about letter writing Sam is that he had excellent penmanship. I never <laughs> liked that Sam I am. <laughs> okay. Hey, Governor. Governor, just want to jump in because I know we could probably go all night long, but I want to see if we couldn't jump in, maybe do one final question. And a couple people were asking because tomorrow is a very key day in Eagle, well, could be Eagle history. So the question that I've had is, do you think, does the panel think, and what would Stan think about whether tomorrow's draft will define the career of Harry Roseman? Okay, we'll start with the pat on that. Well, when I thought about that, and I thought about Howie Roseman in the draft, I thought that Stan would get the biggest kick out of this guy, but he would have given him credit for something. Just when he was about to jump all over Howie Roseman and really take him to task, Howie, who has a choice, has to figure out what quarterback to pick. It's going to be made for him, but they've been looking at tape of Jared Goff and Carson Wentz. Stan would have been swayed that Howie Roseman was smart enough to ask one of the person he respected more than anyone on the earth, Ray Didinger, how he asked Ray who he liked, and that would have won Stan over. There you go. All right, Steve? I mean, either way, whether, whether he's successful or he's not, I, again, Stan, Stan would have been all over this story, and uh, I mean, absolutely is going to define his tenure. As long as it is. All right, Joe. 
I, I again think the same as Steve. I, I just think that uh, Stan, this would be a story that Stan would be all over, and I'm curious to hear what Ray has to say because he's the NFL expert. Ray. I can, I can tell you from having covered many drafts with Stan, Stan loved the NFL draft. Uh, he loved the fact that so many people pretend to know so much about athletes that they've never seen. I mean, Stan thought it was the most amusing thing in the world. I remember one year the Eagles had a scout named Jess Thompson. He was this old guy that used to travel around and watch these teams practice. And Jess Thompson came in one time, and the Eagles drafted a defensive lineman named Richard Harris from Grambling. Mm. Uh, and his first round pick. And the scout came out, none of us had ever seen him play. Scout comes out and he says, Richard Harris is agile, mobile, and hostile, was the scouting report. And Stan wrote the next day, having seen the Eagles draft picks over the years, I suspect that he was more likely to be docile, fragile, and senile. <laughs> All right, let's hear from Stan. The Eagles 2016 draft will indeed define the career of Howie Roseman. Of course, that definition will not be able to be determined for several years, but Howie is emboldened in his return from exile. Not from Babylonia, but from the equipment room at the Novacare Center, <laughs> AKA the other side of the building. Among the lessons learned in his world search of professional franchises, Riverboat gambling seems to be at the top of the list. It is with this latest gamble that Howie is out to prove that he is the man Jeffrey Laurie can count on to save the Eagles, where the plump, fast-talking, know-it-all, smart-ass Chip Kelly could not. Well, if you haven't already guessed, the part of Stan was played by the great Joe Conklin. And let me wrap it up. By saying, uh, my fondest memory of S Stan was his sense of humor. And nowhere was his sense of humor better and more on display than on Angelo Catali's morning show when he played the Grand Poobah. People absolutely loved Stan as the Grand Poobah. He dispensed wisdom with the same clarity and courage that he showed when he wrote his serious columns. But he did it with a great sense of humor. I, I wish IP could put a, 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 an anthology of all those Grand Poobah uh, bits together and, and make it available, because it was hysterical, hysterical. And I once said, after Sam, pa uh, Sam passed away, I said, if God turns out to be Jewish, and we suspect that he is, if God turns out to be Jewish and a male, I assume that he's going to look like and have the wisdom of Stan Hockman. <laughs>